it was it was an interesting ride and i've never heard it. i've told that story to a couple other guys that had a lot of time in a4s and i've never heard anyone say they saw anything like that <laughs> Hey, Fight Song fans, Aaron here, and today in the USA, at least, it is July 4, American Independence Day, uh, July 5 here in Australia, but never mind, um, and it's your 244th Independence Day, so congratulations, America, you're still going, which is good to see. Um, so we've got a great guest on for you today. Some of you will have um, seen him before. He was in the Tomcat live stream event we ran a month or two ago. Um, but he's got a great story for us, which came about because of a, uh, a conversation about uh, what pain people liked in the group. Um, so the one that floated to the top, thanks to Parker, who suggested it, was the A4 Skyhawk. And I got a message from our guest to say, hey, I've got a great Skyhawk story if you want to talk, want to jump on and have a chat about it. So first things first, let me welcome our guest, which is John Hooter Scriber. Welcome, John. How are you doing out there? We're doing great. Now, where are you based, John? Just for people who don't know you, tell us a little bit about your background and where, you, where you're actually located. All right, I'll, I can do that. I, I live in Los Angeles right now. I grew up in the Midwest, Indiana, Missouri, and the East Coast, New Jersey. Um, and uh, I got into military aviation uh, via the space program, basically. And when I was a kid, that was a big thing. And I I, I just loved watching that stuff. I was a space nerd, like many people my age. Um, and went to school, got a little bit lazy, didn't get my uh, engineering degree like I thought I wanted to get. I got something a little bit easier, agronomy and plant genetics, if you want to look that up. <laughs> but it was qualified me to go take the ASVAB and recruiting ride. And I, jo I, I got in and went to officer candidate school and got flight orders. I mean, it, it all worked and it was just kind of dumb luck. I didn't go to the Academy or ROTC or anything like that. And, uh, ended up flying fighters. Uh, and then, uh, after I got my wings, I went to Phantoms, got a little over a thousand hours in that. Then I went back as an instructor to TA four J's in Beeville, Texas. Then I got a 14s. Uh, so, I mean, I had a pretty charmed life in terms of airplane selection. Indeed. And you, um, we, we have a saying in Australia, I don't know if you have it, um, you, you're either there by arse or class. Um, you might have had a bit of both of them just getting into the military without doing jumping through all those other hoops that people had to go through. Yeah, I, I don't know. It worked for me. That's all I can say. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And, and nowadays, I believe you're, um, you're in the, uh, you've left the Navy, obviously, you're in private industry working in the IT field. Um, and you also still fly for the Sky Typers, which I think they just went out and did a gig for July 4 earlier today. Is that right? That is correct. I, I'm doing uh, government IT work. I own my own small business. And I still fly uh, when I can uh, with the Sky Typers. Awesome. Shame they didn't leave you an F-14 to park in the backyard to fly around occasionally. <laughs> right. <laughs> You'd be the most famous man on the planet if that happened. <laughs> I, I do have a small piece of one. So. Oh, okay. Fair enough. <laughs> I, I remember one of the other guests we had on the um, Tomcat show had a, um, they gave him the, the hook off his, off a Tomcat um, as he's going away present when he retired. I thought that was a bit different and interesting. So I do have an A4 tail hook and I've got an F4 and an F14 hook point. And I also have this. Uh, I think I recognize that. Yeah, that's that's the the flash panel for the muzzle of the uh, the Gatling gun. Yeah, I thought so. Cool. They didn't give you an, uh, an M sixty one to take home. It did not. Oh damn! What a shame. <laughs> Boy, is that a venerable gun? It's been around for a long time and still does a great job. Yeah, it's, it it was fun to fire. Yeah, I can imagine. 
So um, I guess one of the questions a lot of people, oh, actually two things. Um, how long were you in the military? When did you re retire? Just so we get a bit of a, a timeline there. I, let's see, I got in in 1977, which was actually year group 78 because it was the end of 1977. So I started in the Navy in year group 78 and I retired with about 18 years. Uh, I had gone to do other things late in my career and the wall came down and it was hard to get flight orders. I retired early. They offered me an early retirement. So I, I ended up doing about 18 years. I retired, I want to say, I could do arithmetic, but arithmetic in public is always embarrassing. <laughs> it was some, I think about 1993 when I retired. Okay. And um, the, the classic question for all for current and former fighter pilots, how did you get your call sign? Which is, for those that didn't hear me earlier, is Hooter, H-O-O-T-E-R. Well, that was one of my call signs. Ah, on, okay. I, I'm a unique guy that I, I had a whole bunch of friends in the attack community and they were with me when I was an instructor for INTA4Js. So that call sign was Earl. And that came about from, there's a paint company in the US called Earl Scheib. My last name is Schreiber, shortened to Schreib. Sounds like Earl Scheib. So I became Earl, in some cases, Earl the Pearl, who I guess used to be a basketball player. Okay. My, call sign was earned from a briefing that I gave about uh, that in included the term the phrase if you're going to hoot with the owls you better be able to scream with the eagles so I became hooter after that for a while and there is another hooter in the navy as well right uh, uh, as long as it's not related to that restaurant chain it with, is the, not. with the s on the end of it, <laughs> it I am not Okay, cool, cool. All right, so you're going to talk to us today about the TA4J and a, a, a very, very interesting flight that you had in one. Um, so mind, do you mind starting out with telling us a bit about the TA4J for people who don't really know anything about it, and then we'll sort of dive into the story? Well, it, it's a hard airplane lookup. I was looking up. It's the only airplane I don't have the NATOPS for. Um, I, I wish I did. I was a NATOPS officer. I should have snuck one home, but I didn't. <laughs> Um, it's a single seat jet in most cases, the Warbird is, and then the TA-4J has a back seat for an instructor or student if they're flying instrument stuff. Um, it had a, a, uh, J-57 P-8A, uh, Pratt & Whitney engine, kind of gutless on hot days, but it was still, a, it was still a sport jet. I mean, it still had... 720 degrees per second roll rate with full aileron de deflection. So it, it could water your eyes. And, and it was good in AC, ACM. It was even the two seat was real capable in, in ACM. I mean, I used to fight them when I was uh, flying F4s and F14s out of either VF-126 or Top Gun. Mm -hmm. Although they also had the, the more powerful, uh, I think they called them the, uh, um, the, the super Foxtrot or something like that. It, was, it had big P408 engine in it and it, it was a slick single seat airplane. Yeah. And I suppose but, mo most people who have seen the movie Top Gun, which is probably everyone watching this would probably recognize that it's the, the two seater version of the um, single A4 Skyhawk that the instructors were flying there. Now the, the airplane is tiny. It is narrow. My shoulders touch the canopy and I, I weighed 100 and I don't know 35 pounds when I was flying this thing, and it was tight for me. I mean, it, it was hard to turn around. You you did you turned around by reaching behind and pushing on the other side of the airplane so you could get your shoulders around, and and you you could if you worked really hard you could see. You could watch an airplane cross your tail. Unlike the Tomcat, which had uh, a bullet, I had it described once as the Cadillac with all that room in it. Yeah, it was it was a, a, a it, it was a big sofa up front. Yeah, and a, it was a big airplane. Okay, so um, tell us a bit about the the story. What what's the background, and um, let's dig into it. Well, I was looking at my logbook, and uh, 
it appears it was on uh, January 30, 1986. It was my second hop of the day. And it was an interesting hop in that the student that I was with was actually already selected to be an instructor pilot. So I flew two flights, one against him, and then one with him in my back seat, him in my front seat, and I'm in his back seat. And after the student flight that we had, uh, we continued on with an instructor under training portion of it. So it was kind of a mixed bag. Um, it was now, like sorry to interrupt, but you, you were actually a, an instructor at this stage, training him to be an instructor. Is that right? That is correct. He was a good. He was a good pilot. He's a young kid, but but a good pilot. And uh, you know, when they did what they called the Sir Grad program, the selectively retained graduates, it, it, you knew that those guys were good because uh, that's what we took. And it looks like we did a one point three. And I, I will, I will save the recovery back to base for later. Mm -hmm. A little. So I'll keep you guys here the rest of the. Especially the briefing. Not don't, you don't don't leave as soon as we're done with the spin. Not not the, yeah, well, the spin part. Yeah. So that's the background. It, we fl flew out of uh, Chase Field NAS in Beeville, Texas. As I recall, it was a pretty clear, cold day. Not terribly cold, but uh, you know, brisk, and and the airplane was performing extremely well. And and uh, we went out. And we did what we had to do. And uh, uh, then it came to the point where. I need to show him how to recognize he was going to get into a bad situation with a student. And I'll explain that. The TA-4J had two drop tanks on wing stations that we had. They called them drop tanks, but they were keep tanks. I don't think we could actually punch them off. And the reasoning for that was if you had hung gear, you could land on the tanks and do almost no damage to the airplane. Mm. Never thought of that. Yeah, uh, two 300 gallon drop tanks. So each one's about 2,000 pounds. So that's about 4,000 pounds of extra weight there. Um, and I have flown it clean. It's a much nicer airplane, clean. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, so we had the two drop tanks and the TA4J with the two drop tanks, you didn't want to go to zero airspeed at 90 to 110 degrees nose up. It was because it tended to fall back on itself and then go right to this configuration and just a nice, steady, fairly slow rotation, a little bit of rocking and rolling as you're doing that, but almost impossible to get out of. So that's, you would see that sometimes when a student would start up after somebody and not be pure vertical, but in the oblique, and he finds that he's losing angles, so he reverses and pulls back the other direction and next thing you know, you're right there looking at zero airspeed and you're off to the races. <laughs> so I was explaining how to recognize what, what you'll see and what, what you would key on was this. If, if the bogey that he was chasing started crossing his nose and he's going to reverse back, you hit the stick forward, knock it off and get out of there. Just take it out of his hand, you know, call, hey, I've got the plane, stick forward and get that roll out if you can still and keep it from going to 90 degrees nose high uh, and, and off you go. So I'm showing this to the guy in the front seat and um, I go up, I go, okay, here, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to reverse my roll from no, I'm sorry, we're going to reverse my pitch from going over this way. I'm going to go back and go this way. And that if you don't stop me soon enough, we're going to end up in a bad position. Probably something I shouldn't have done. But I did. <laughs> uh, what's that? Hindsight is 2020 vision. <laughs> yeah, because your eyes get real big. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So as we did this, he didn't take the plane from me and it got too deep and the inertia was going where it was going and, and like you know i should have stopped it i guess but i didn't so we ended up boom like that now we did about three turns 
and it real gentle turns and we're talking and I'm, I'm talking him through. I gave him the airplane. I said, okay, now recover it and gave him the airplane and we're talking in just normal voice. And I go through the checklist, you know, zero, four degrees uh, on the trim, uh, throttles to idle, stick forward, neutral lateral, rudder opposite, you know, we're doing everything and it's, it's just nice and steady. And then it said, oh yeah, what about this? And it turned on its side. And we fell, I'm guessing 3,500, maybe 4,000 feet, maybe a little bit more, just sideways. And that was a little unsettling because I'd never heard anyone talk about that. Did you have a question? I was going to say, were you crapping your pants at that stage? That, that was a little scary, but, but we were like, all right, well, maybe it's going to come out this way. So I took the airplane at that point as we, as, as it did, as it went from upside down to on its side, I took the airplane at that point. I was like, well, that's interesting. So I'm doing some stuff just to try to get it to break. I'm, I'm moving the flap handle up and down a little bit, just trying to get the nose to pitch. I'm putting the speed brakes in and out trying to do something, moving the throttle a little bit, moving the stick a little bit. And then it said, oh yeah, watch this, boom, right upside down again. But it, start, it was starting to oscillate as it was upside down, a little bit more each time around. And about, I'd say two or three turns after that, we're getting close to 10,000 feet. And that was our, our hard deck in the training command. So he said, hey, we're getting close to 10. You want to get out? I go, I think I'm going to be okay. I'm getting some inertia on this thing. Literally, we're talking like that. I said, go down to five, and no matter what I say at 5,000 feet, punch us out. Okay, okay. I've, got to, I've got to interrupt and ask you. <laughs> Surely um, ejecting from a plane upside down is probably the least desirable option you can come up with. Uh, that is true. Uh, although... It was supposed to be able to handle the seat was supposed to be able to handle it. I don't think it was zero zero for anything like that, certainly, mm -hmm. but, but it was at 5,000 feet. We'd be out by about 4,500, maybe 4,000. We should be okay. Okay. Unless the airplane just plain hit us. But with the change in CG, the airplane would probably come out of the spin and fly away anyway. <laughs> but, so it's starting to rock and, and kind of oscillate a little bit as it's going around. And again, I, I'm just moving stuff around that we weren't trained to do, but it was working. And, and as we come through about uh, 6,500 feet or so, it just kind of rolled over. The airspeed increased to about 150 knots. So now I know it's flying. And we're in a fairly steep dive, but not terribly steep. And we bottom out 5,000, maybe, maybe 3,000 feet. Not exactly sure, but... I had it under control by 5,000 and I just said, Hey, it's under control. I've got the airplane air, air speeds increasing all before 5,000 feet. So he didn't just punch us out of a good airplane. And we, you know, climbed up and no big deal. And Oh, by the way, if, if I had gotten out, it wouldn't have done any damage other than a big hole in the ground. Cause there was nothing underneath us so up, up by Victoria, Texas out over just a bunch of rangeland there would be found a prize bull or whatever that was frightened by the crash and there would be money to pay, but it wouldn't have killed anybody. <laughs> Unless so how, how was the flight back to base? Well, that, that was, that was good. Um, we, we debriefed, you know, what happened and everything. And, and he said, uh, why didn't, why didn't you want to get out at 10,000 feet? And I said, that's going to be a very big question when we get back. I said, you tell the story as you saw it. I'll tell the story as I saw it, but I'll tell you why I did that. I was getting the airplane to respond to things I was doing. And that's why I said, no matter what I say, if I don't say I've got it under control by 5,000 feet, punch us out. So uh, he said, okay. And, and, you know, they split us up. I talked to the maintenance O and the skipper and the ops O and, and they understood, although there was quite a bit of uh, gnashing of teeth and furrowing of brow when I said, yeah, we went through 10,000 feet out of control and they wanted to know why. And I told them and I said, okay, well, uh, the result was good. But part of my debrief to the maintenance though was something that, uh, that uh, uh, we had noticed when we were flying the airplane out to the area. 
the rudder trim was all over the place. We had to change it with uh, almost all speed changes. Sometimes the ball was out to the right, sometimes out to the left, whatever. And it was kind of, and all squadrons have airplanes like that where it's bent in mm. some way, shape, or form. I don't know if it's a tab or what, but it, it, it just flies weird. And that airplane, I don't know, a few weeks, maybe a couple months later, actually did crash from a uh, out of control situation but it was different in that the student after they'd gone through the checklist the student's survival vest got hung up on the nose trim and ran it all the way to nose up full nose up so even though they got it out of the spin they couldn't recover from the stall because it was in full nose up trim and they they didn't double check the trim and run it down and they had to get out Mm. so i don't know if they're if they're start was a result of what we kind of felt i don't know i i don't think it was a zero airspeed departure i think it was just a plain old accelerated departure um, yeah but uh it, it it that that the airplane i flew that day a few weeks later was a smoking hole <laughs> it's probably better if you guys what happened to you did it then rather than later on right and on top of all that this was the teaser the weather at the base had gotten bad. So we then had to fly a, a, an instrument approach back into the base. So uh, we go through all the, the ACM out over clear skies and then have to fly a, uh, an actual approach into the base to land. What a lot of fun that is. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I'm just thinking that the idea of the plane falling sideways, <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen that done before. That must've been, uh, have, have you it, ever had that happen to you before or since? No, it, it was very stable. I mean, literally, it was on the knife edge and just falling. And we were both like, what is it doing? I No one had talked to me about that. I've talked to a lot of A4 guys. I've never heard of that kind of departure. I may have talked to all the A4 guys, but it was, it was, it was oddly calming as we were going through it because we knew what we were trying to do and we had briefed it beforehand. So uh, we we were ready to do something, but we weren't we were not ready for the the sideways slide, and that's that's when I took the airplane back. I, I as soon as we got upside down at ninety degrees uh, at zero airspeed, I, I thought, okay, well, boy, this is going to be a big one. We're going to get out of this airplane, and I won't fly for a few days. Um, <laughs> and uh, but uh, as it turned out, it. They took the debrief. We wrote up some sort of message traffic about it, and um, it was no big deal. I, I think I actually flew the next day. I flew the next day. So you, you didn't generate any, any significant notoriety in the Navy community over that little episode? Nope, not at all. Not at all. Okay, cool. And, and how did your instructor student go? Um, he went on for bigger and better things, I guess? Yeah, I lost track of him because when I left, he stayed there for another two and a half years. And I, I just don't know where he went. I could probably find him somewhere, but he was a good stick. I enjoyed having him as a student. I went through I, I, uh, a lot of the tactics and the ACM part of the program with him. And um, he wasn't a primary student of mine, but uh, I, I flew with him several times. And I think he was a an LSO wannabe, so he was out at the platform with us, I believe. So you know, he was involved. He, he wanted to. He wanted to play the game. He wanted to do do it right. Yeah, sounds good. Okay, cool. All right. Well, that was a that's a pretty exciting story. Or rather, you than me. I probably would have bloody, as I said, crapped my pants doing with that happening to me. But you're obviously a bit more experienced in that department. So well, um, I, I believe I believe you've got a little teaser for us for another story. We're going to come back and chat about another day. Yeah, uh, uh, there, there. I have a memorable takeoff out of Fort Bliss, which is a very poorly named fort, by the way. <laughs> uh, that's at, at El Paso. Um, on a very hot day, I was flying with a student back from. Uh, uh, carrier qualifications in San Diego. We stopped in El Paso for gas and we're heading back to Beeville. And uh, I got to look up some of the technical terms, but there's a gauge in the A4, TA4J, and I think it's in all of them. I think it's called EPR. And I can't remember what that stands for. I think it's exhaust pressure 
rating or ratio or something, and you're supposed to have X amount, 3.7 or better or something like that before you take off. And uh, the fun begins at that point. I'll just let you know. Sounds good. I look forward to hearing the story. So. One, more, one more teaser on that. A jackrabbit is involved. Oh, okay. <laughs> I hope it wasn't in the plane with you. Thankfully, no. <laughs> Good to hear. Good to hear. Okay, cool. All right, Huda. Well, look, thanks very much for catching up with me. It was great. I uh, love the story. Very cool. Um, and uh, enjoy the rest of your July 4, what's left of it. And uh, I'm sure we will um, speak again. All right, mate. Thanks for having me. No worries. Good to speak to you again. You have a good day. You too, mate. Bye.